ya lo hace, pierna derecha, directo al arco, golazo, golazo, golazo. The world of football with a soccer perspective. This is Soccer Today with Dwayne Rollins and Kevin Laramay, live on the Sports Podcasting Network. Good day, good night, and welcome to Soccer Today for Thursday, July 25th, 2019. Cup set last night, an amazing night in the Canadian Championship. And to talk about the historic result from Cavalry, we have Cavalry's FC Zone manager, their head coach, Tommy Wilden Jr., joining us this morning. Does it feel like a dream, Tommy, or does it feel still real this morning when you woke up? Yeah, great question. Um, it's funny because uh, my wife will t- tell you this is uh, the day of a game. I'm always up early. The day after a game, I'm always up early. You always, as I think, as a, as a manager, you're always processing, processing, processing. Whether it's team selection or team result, um, I think that was it. I think I was about three or four hours of sleep and up and processing the game last night. So. Yeah, I guess it just it feels a bit of a blur. Um, I haven't watched a game back yet, so I think once I get on the plane now, because we head straight to Winnipeg today, is you know I'll sit there watch the game, you look at some of the things we did well, some of the things we didn't do as well as we'd like to, um, and let it sink in because it was a it was a great night. I, it was a great night for for anyone who's been hoping for the Canadian Premier League for a while, and and I know this is Cavalry's victory, not the Canadian Premier League's victory, but it's a little bit of both, I think, for the historic first time. Tommy, when we first talked to you uh, a few years ago, you were in the PDL with Foothills. You were going into yeah. the championship weekend. Yeah. Um, were you at that time in the back of your head, be honest now, was this a dream that you were having then, that you would be in Calgary's colors doing something like this? Yeah, do you know what... Um... Uh, I'll answer that because I do feel it is uh, definitely a, a special moment for our football club. But I think, you know, the way the Canadian Premier League is working, uh, you, you should have seen the messages of support prior that we all shared to, to Jimmy at York and Stephen at HFX. It, it's, it very much is uh, encompassing the, the Canadian ethos. You know, we are many, we are one. And when all of us have competed as well as we have, you know, there was a lot of shared enjoyment with that because... You know, and you've heard it, you're in the game. People wanted to know, well, what is the Canadian Premier League? What are they about? How does it compare? You know, I kept getting asked that question about, um, you know, it's a lower tier. I said, well, no, it isn't actually. We're a new league. We're a different league. Uh, we're not as established as the MLS. The MLS is America's tier one. We're starting Canada's tier one. And it's up to us now to gain respect through results, performances like we've just done. Uh, and we did it. So... And then to flip to your other point about you know when we spoke on on the Foothills uh, PDL journey, absolutely this, this was all part of the vision. You know when I came to this country 18 years ago, I came to play and I you know I was just having a life experience, but I quickly fell in love with the place and the people, and I, I've shared this publicly. You know this is my way of giving back to a country that's adopted me as a citizen um, uh, and and a city that's welcomed me. So. This is just part of a journey that we're on. We wanted to bring the markets. You know, the, the Canadian MLS markets have done great for the soccer fandom in this country, but it was up to us to all play our part. So, you know, through through the work I did, you know, with Leon Hapkins and, 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 and Danny Hay at Foothills to, and Mike McCusker to get to here now was all part of the journey. And Spruce Meadows have bought right in because they love Canada. They're proudly Canadian. And our ownership group has said, right, let's, uh, let's, let's, you know, make a difference. And, and that's what, that's what we're doing. If five players on the roster that, that came directly from the Whitecaps Academy system and another player that came out of TFC's Academy system, do you think that it was a little extra motivation for players like that to step up and show that maybe they deserved a chance when they were in those academies and didn't get a look at the first team? Was that something that motivates these CAMPL players in general when they're playing MLS opposition? Yeah, I think if you go anywhere in the in the world, there's always second chance loons. You know, you can't... It's very tough to to find an Alfonso Davis that's legit at 18 or 19. Um, what what the Canadian Premier League does is it gives players a, a chance to develop, play, and play meaningful minutes. You know, we had a young player like Malik Hamilton that left Calgary at 14 to go play at, at West Ham's academy. Didn't quite cut, cut it there as an 18-year-old, came to TFC. Didn't quite cut it there. He's still only 19. He's 20 this year. And we still think he's got a bright future. You just need time. And uh, fortunately, the Canadian Premier League is built for that. It's a league, you know, as it said, by Canadians, for Canadians. Um, the rules are great. And, and you're seeing the young players across, whether it's at 
you know, Pacific's young cr- uh, crop or, you know, Tyler Tardo that's scoring goals for, for Valor or, you know, you know Tristan Borges that's uh, doing well for Forge. These guys, these guys are good players. Now they're getting a chance in a professional league to, to show what they're worth. In the words of Rémy Garde, coach of the Montreal Impact, your next opponent in the Canadian Championship. Ooh, that sounds pretty good to hear. But uh, in the words of Rémy Garde, talking about Canadian Premier League team yesterday, mostly York 9, but in general, they're a good team. They're they're good soccer team. They're playing well. And there's a one particular sequence from last night at about the 84th minute when Cavalry's got the ball. They're under pressure, but they keep possession of the ball, and they maybe do 12 passes, and they break down the defense back line of Vancouver, and I had those words resonating in my mind. Those guys are as good, and they're all... They're, they're, Calgary looked organized last night, Tommy, and for me, mm-hmm. how did you achieve this in three months, quote-unquote, maybe let's say six months of working with the, the group, versus teams that have been together for a long time. I had many listeners ask me that question online, so uh, I'm sending it to you. How were you able to make that team so competitive so quickly? <laughs> I think that's longer than the 15 minutes we've got. Um, <laughs> this has been, uh, it, it's a funny one because the Cavalry, absolutely, it's a, it's a separate and distinct and its own in, in terms of Spruce Meadows, its own venue, its own professional club. Um, but I, I start on this journey. I look at young Elijah Adekubi that I, I knew when he was nine, uh, when he was in the Foothills Academy. Dominic Zator is the same. Uh, Marco Carducci, I didn't coach him. He came through the Calgary Villains, but you knew of him. So, you, you know, these players that you know, you just... It was, a, it was a great thing to bring back. So I tell you, you know, having that PDL championship win inside does set a precedent because we hit the final twice in four years. But you set a winning culture. From there, we, we said, right, what's working in this winning culture? Who are these players that can come with us? So, you know, I also, uh, along with the work with, with Leon Hapka to build the Foothills program, you know, I've got my brother who, who was an absolute warrior in there, but he's, he's a bright, bright mind. He's going to be a bright coach as well. He's going to, you know, follow on in, in the legacy and, and, and keep growing Canadian football. Um, but then I wanted to bring in somebody, you know, some Canadians around me that have a separate, uh, unique outlook um that could give me an honest opinion and when i started doing my due diligence martin nash his name kept coming up what i love about martin he is so black and white and honest he doesn't do it for his reputation or anything like that he does it because he just loves the game he's always about football he's always about you know this that and the other when i have a decision to make he challenges it and then when we we make it a laugh uh, because i got a quote off my old friend sean fleming And he used to call himself Mr. 51% when he was the Canada at the 17. So me and Patrick Tobo <laughs> would uh, you know, offer opinions. He's like, yeah, yeah, okay, I like that. But it, it does. It's, as, as a manager, you become Mr. 51%. So I brought Martin in. And what Martin has is a wealth of knowledge of the Canadian game and great pedigree as, as wanting to give back to it. And Jordan Santiago is another one that, you know, he was a kid that had to leave Calgary as a young kid to go abroad to play, come back. So what I did is built a staff. And when, when, when we had that great run with Foothills, it was like, right, which one of these guys are deserving of the chance to come with us? You know, so a lot of people scoffed when I was making the signings of the tour, Chris Serb and Dean Northovers, Jay Wield, and um, just why it's just, it's it, Elijah Adekubi, it's just going to be their, their PDL team. But if you're anywhere else in the world, if you win a championship, you're getting promoted. We got promoted. But what we also realized is we now have to click the upgrade button. You know, so getting Nick Ledgerwood in when we did, he wasn't coming in to play BDL. He was coming in to galvanize the locker room and also help us on the leadership because a coach and managers, and we can lead from our vision and our daily interactions. But if you have the wrong players in the locker room, they can undo all your good work. Fortunately, you know, Nick Ledgerwood was the, was the right man. Then it became Mason Trafford as well that had worked with Martin, played with him at, at Whitecaps, worked with him at Ottawa. And then it became, you know, right, We've got our local core and contingent, uh, and then which national, you know, Canadian nationals could, can we bring back that will be great part of this journey? You know, Maro Stachios, Nico Giant Sopolis is obviously the, these guys came in, and then from there, that's when we looked overseas and said, right, what don't we have? Well, we don't have centre forward, so that's where Jordan Brown and Dominic Malonga we wanted the experience and youth. Um, you looked at Jose Escalante because he's an exciting left winger, and he showed, you know, he's played in North America. Julian Boucher has played in North America. And I tell you, a lot of it was, you know, we could go through 
YouTube clips, Insta clips, highlight reels of all these players. But for me, it all centers down. If you're going to achieve anything, you do it with great people. And we looked through hundreds and hundreds of players and we whittled it down to players that we thought could improve us. And then it was conversations like this, whether it was in person or over FaceTime, just to get the right people in. And I tell you, once you do that, every day is a, is a day to grow together and we, and we embrace it. So that's, I guess, when you talk about how we've achieved it in a, in a two or three minute speech, that, that's probably it in a nutshell. You mentioned Martin Nash, and I'm wondering how special last night was for him, assistant with Cavalry, but legend of the Vancouver Whitecaps uh, for, for a long, long, long time. How does how did his contribution help to win the series, and uh, how was his presence and maybe his motivation helping as well during the series? Do you know, it's not just a series, it's, it's every day. He's, he's invaluable because, like I said, you, when, you, when you're in the trenches, you need people around you you trust. And, and with him, uh, you know, I trust wholeheartedly. Um, he, he was brilliant. You know, we, we laugh and joke because, you know, we've got different strengths that offset each other. And, you know, he, he's been due diligence on, uh, you know, the corner that, that that scored there. You know, I've got to give credit to him. He, he, he took care of things. He said, look, this is where we can attack them. This is what, you know, type of service, delivery. And he sees pieces like that. Um, you know, the funny thing is about him, he doesn't get too high or too low. He just, you know, <laughs> walked off casually into the locker room, saw his family there, chatted to a few people. He's just so down to earth. It, 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 it's, it's breathtaking. So I think it's a special night for him. I said to him, because, uh, you know, he's Mark DeSantis' friend. You know, they work together at Ottawa. They shared some journeys. But also, going back into Whitecaps, where his brother's a minority owner as well. And, you know, it's, it, it's going to be interesting being on the plane with him uh, today to see how he's reflecting. It's funny being in Canadian soccer circles where uh, Martin's the more famous Nash brother, but uh, but that aside, <laughs> um, Tommy, let's, let's turn our attention for the final question for me uh, on the league itself. You were so dominant in that uh, in that spring season, uh, clinched the spot in the final, uh, which will be held in November. Of course, you'll be a part of that championship contender, so you are two wins away uh, from winning the, the Campiel Championship, yet you have an entire fall season to play. How do mm-hmm. you approach that mentally and, and literally, uh, tactically, heading into a fall season where you've already clinched that berth in the final? Yeah, uh, we, we set out uh, um, in our game plan uh, as we entered our, our meetings with our players. And, and basically, you, you, you do a, a goals review and say, right, what do we want to achieve? We wanted to win the spring season because we knew it put us in there as the first ever. Um, it was a sprint, so we prepared it like a tournament. We knew that we had to have 23 players that could all step up and play. Given the length and breadth of this country, we're in one of the biggest countries. We need to play a rotation. We also needed to have an adaptable, flexible system. Like last night, you saw the best side of our defensive and transition game. You know, on other games, you'll see an exciting attack and possession game. I think we're very, very versatile in that way. Um, so for us, you know, we, we had 14 guys that, that saw the field last night. We got a squad of 23. Um, you know, Chris Servan's unfortunately out for the season with his knee injury, but there's other guys that didn't see the field that want to, but they're ready to play their part. Uh, there's guys that left home that are either recovering from injury or, or didn't get selected that want to play their part. I don't have to motivate them too much because the second objective they wanted to do was to win the fall season. And the reason being is then you become the undisputed champion, irrespective of what happens in the championship game. That's just another cup final home and away like we've just had with Whitecaps. But I tell you, when you win back-to-back spring and fall, there's no denying that over the course of 28 games, you're the best team in the Canadian Premier League. So the guys want to attack that. You know, we've started the full season very, very well. Um, and that's the motivation. You know, I know the boys now getting on the plane will already they'll be enjoying it, but they'll have their mind on Valor and saying, right, who's playing? Who's up? Let's keep this perfect record. Let's keep this run going because, you know, our next game after that is Montreal and the guys are playing for places. Speaking of Montreal, August 7th in Montreal, the first leg of the semifinal between Montreal and Cavalry. So, Tommy, I guess I'll see you in a few weeks time yeah that sounds like that'll be a lot of fun <laughs> Tommy Bilden Jr. manager of Cavalry FC thank you very much for your time today congratulations once again and we hope for the best for Cavalry for the rest of the fall season in the Canadian Premier League thank you very much thanks for having us on and we'll be right back after this very short break
You are listening to Soccer Today. Follow us on Twitter at Soccer Today SPN and like our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash sports podcasting network. You can find the podcast version of all the shows we do on iTunes, Apple Podcast, Google Play Store, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and anywhere you get your podcast. August 7th, 2019, the battle of the best dressed soccer coaches in Canada. Tommy Wilden Jr. versus Rimi Gab, and the winner gets a nice new tie. Uh. Greg Vanny might have something to say with that too. He's okay, pretty fine. sharp got you. Yeah, um, different kind of style. There's there's kind of a different type of style there. Uh, Greg, uh, Tommy's got a bit of that uh, Western influence coming in there. Of course, Miguel's got the French influence there. There's, that's a different type of podcast, though. <laughs> one that I may not be uh, qualified to speak to Kevin. Um, Cavalry could beat the Impact. I'm not saying they will, but they could. They could. And I think any M- any MLS team, Toronto as well, any MLS team would be stupid, dumb, <laughs> to take yeah. them lightly. The way they played, like that's what I was mentioning to Tommy Dwayne. There's a sequence where Cavalry is just passing the ball, moving the ball around, and Vancouver doesn't know what to do. And if you don't know any better and you're told, yeah, that there's – Two teams of different leagues. One technically is lower, at least newer. Well, let's let's be respectful and use the newer term because they, they beat the higher seeded team. So there's a newer team. You would think, yeah, Vancouver's a newer team, and Cavalry has been playing together for six, seven years for sure. Look at how they're playing. But no. Uh, but uh, just to to go back on Tommy's words for a second, Nick Ledgerwood, how massive he was last night butchered uh, as well was impressive in the defensive midfield and uh Adikube could have played Elijah Adikube plays in the same position and usually during the regular season he's the first choice for one of the first choice as defensive midfield uh, but the manager Tommy Wilden went with Ledgerwood and butchered there because he knew that their size, their strength, and their maturity mentality would help this team late in the game. And I have another image. It's 75th minute. There's a dangerous progression from Vancouver coming into Calgary's territory. Nick Ledgerwolves fouls the player from Vancouver. There's a turnover, and Calgary's got the ball. Those are exactly the moments why Nick Ledgerwood is with Cavalry. And one of the reasons why Cavalry is able to take it to Vancouver, sure, when you look at the possession, Dwayne, there's a big disparity, 38% versus 62%, but it doesn't matter. It's the box score. It's the amount of goals scored at the end, and at the end of the day, Cavalry 2, Vancouver 1. Yeah, well, Nick Ledgerwood, with all due respect to the, to the Voices Cup, which is a competition we both know and love dearly, with all, you know, Nick Ledgerwood's played at higher stages. So he's absolutely going yes. to be part of, of this moving forward. That's why he's been brought to brought that veteran leadership. You know, the reason I picked Cavalry to win the Campiel at the start of the season was for because of exactly what Tommy said. They, they had the best core of players going in. That familiarity, like how they were able to do it in three months. The short answer to what he gave is because they're not three months old. They are years old, right? That's <laughs> true. That's the short answer. And, you know, he's, he's trying to, you know, try and make sure that people understand that they aren't foothills. There's something completely different. And that's, you know, kind of a positioning branding answer more than a literal one. They're tied into that. And that connection really matters, as it does in Hamilton with Sigma and the Forge and their connections. And that's why those two teams are, I think, head and shoulders above the rest of the league right now. And, you know, and we will see Hamilton represent the CAMPL on an international stage a week from today uh, when they start the, the CONCACAF uh, Conca League. So, it, you know, that's going to be an exciting competition. We'll talk a lot about what next week. But, oh, yesterday, man. Like, I don't want to overplay it, and I'm being yeah. so trying to pump the brakes a little bit. What this means is that Calgary is better than Vancouver on this day. Yes. That does not change That's the true. fact that, that you know, you want to higher level, lower level. Let's just put it this way, which is indisputable. Vancouver has 10 times the budget of Calgary. Yes. There's no excuse for them to not <laughs> win this, and, and trust me, I wanted to focus on the positive. I wanted to focus on Calgary today. We could have spun our way into like a bash white cap kind of <laughs> kind of show 100 oh, percent. but you know what calgary deserves better yeah we, we need to focus on the positive and, and look we'll 
plenty of time to talk about Vancouver. <laughs> Listen to our show with Dan Riccio last week if you want to get into that. Uh, yeah. It's a disaster there, there's no doubt. And you know, I just hope nothing rash happens today in Vancouver because – you know, yeah. I have this. I was kind of half afraid that I'd wake up to like MDF fired kind yeah. of tweets, and and that that's thankfully not occurring. But but and nonetheless, to go back to, to Calgary, they're just so well put together, and this competition matters so much for them right now. You can tell that. Look, I go into that Impact match, and obviously the Impact. You know, they've got Piatti, who's played last night against York Dynamo. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, back, and, and there's the talent level is just so much different that you would think that Montreal would find a way through that. But do not discount them because of that motivation factor. It's, it's, and I asked him regarding this directly: is like how, you know, it's difficult sometimes to get up against lower level competition. And he didn't, you know, he didn't play a coach political answer. He said, "Yeah, you're right. It is." But they're a good team, and we have to prepare our players like that. And I'm sure that's exactly what they're doing. They'll be they'll, they'll point to this and go, "They beat the Whitecaps. They beat an MLS team." Yeah. Do you want to be embarrassed? Look at these tweets. Look at their fans ripping them. Do you want to be that? That's what they have to be. The impact are going to have to match the intensity that Calgary is going to bring. That's true. In that tie, otherwise they could be the next one. The next one we're talking about in this way. Uh, Jamie Gal mentioned last night after the York Nine game how impressed he was with some players. Like those players are good. Like. It's a lower league, but it's a good league, and it's good for Canadian soccer. He mentioned, but it's it's not that easy. Like they're they're not gonna just lay down for the higher opposition. Of course not. And in the York Nine game yesterday, yes, it took a penalty. It took a handball by uh, Dia Abzi in the box from York Nine. Yes, it was a deliberate handball where Nacho Piatti deliberately chipped the ball on Abzi's hand, but Abzi's hand was outside his body. There's only so much you can do. You're the ref. He, the ref. That's that's another question. I want to talk about positive things too, so I'm not going to talk about David Barry's game last night. But uh, when you look at the referee, he sees the ball touch the hand. He waits like three to five seconds. And then once the crowd's reaction becomes inevitable, he just, okay, points to the spot. And penalty Montreal. one nothing Nacho Piatti, which congratulations to Nacho Piatti on his... Uh, upcoming ch- child, too. Uh, his wife is pregnant, which explains the celebration. And uh, he said, I've wanted to do this for a while, but I wasn't playing, so I couldn't celebrate. So, <laughs> so she's a few months pregnant, but the celebration came a little better late than never. But you're right, for, for the Montreal Impact, they have to worry about the league, too. And the standings in Major League Soccer, they're in a precarious position. They need a win. The loss against Columbus is really painful. And against the Philadelphia Union on Saturday, they need a big result. They need a big win at home against the best team in the East. And it's not going to be easy to focus on both the Canadian Championship and the league. And according to players, to Nacho Piatti and to James Pentimus, especially, who had his first start for Montreal last night, the Canadian Championship is an objective for the Montreal Impact this year. They haven't won it in a few years, and they want to bring it back to Montreal. It's not going to be easy to battle on the two fronts of the league and the Canadian Championship, heading into a matchup with a team that's going to be motivated and youthful and very determined in cavalry. Oh, absolutely. Look, it's not a straight line as it has been in many years, and that's good for this competition, you know. You look at the other tie, which, of course, for the third year running is the Fury versus TFC. TFC yeah. having received the bye to the semifinals. I'm, I'm not willing to like completely give a pass there, too. I think TFC is a slightly bigger favorite there based on, form, on Calgary's form more than anything else. But but nonetheless, it, it's it's just good to be talking about this competition in the, in the way that we are. It was a... It was a match tournament before, and the games were great, but it wasn't a tournament in the truest sense. I'll be the first to admit that, right? Like, it wasn't really a knockout tournament. It was a competition between Montreal, Vancouver, and Toronto with a fourth team thrown in for good measure, and and it it never really laid up to the, or went up to the full thing. Even look at how much it's been so remarkable this year, and this Calgary win has made this indisputably you know, the last time the Canadian Championship, the Voyager's Cup, was this good probably was the year, the, well, the first time the competition happened in 2008 when Montreal pulled the upset over the then, well, was it an upset? I don't know. We can make that yeah, argument in hindsight. But yeah. 
but certainly upset the higher level, in disputed higher level in MLS by getting the draw in, in Toronto on that that infamous day uh, way back in 2008, which was the beginning of a, a long spiral of silliness for TFC in many ways. But nonetheless, that that competition I don't think has had this type of drama since the round robin days. It just truly hasn't. Now even the PLSQ and the League One Ontario teams really added to this. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember Vaughn scoring in Halifax. I, I you know, blame you with the way that they played tough against against York. It, those two teams added something to this, and now you sort of add the added dimension of having, you know, seen them play well against teams that then played well against MLS, and you start to go, maybe the gap isn't that big for these kids, and maybe they can get there. And, and I think that this is just a remarkable day for Canadian soccer and for those that believe in Canadian soccer because it's, not because it proves anything definitively. It doesn't. It's one game. No, yeah. Vancouver, as we all know, is on horrific form, <laughs> as bad a form as any MLS team in Canada has ever been on. Calgary is on great form, as great as any Canadian team has ever been on, in both within their own context. But what it does do is it does it gives some belief to the Canadian player, to those that watch the Canadian player. It forces those that dismiss the Canadian player to sort of reflect a little bit and say, you know what? Maybe we're not that far off, and maybe it was just a lack of opportunity for years that has been holding us back. And now that this league is in place, maybe we can dare to allow ourselves to dream. To me, that's what last day's result Matt, have meant. That's what la- why last night's result is special and is important. It really was. It was a remarkable day for Canadian soccer. Sorry, Whitecaps fans. <laughs> sorry, Whitecaps. <laughs> but it was. And, and sorry, HFX Wanderers. Uh, you battled hard. You even scored twice on the road, but it wasn't enough. The Fury were able to come out with their result and will face Toronto FC in the other semifinal. But I have to say, for for the Wanderers traveling to Ottawa, scoring twice on the road, they conceded the one goal. And, and unfortunately, they are not going to be able to move through, but they did battle hard too. And uh, Ottawa had a lot to prove in this game, and there's a, were a lot of politics in this game, but at the end of the day, it was a good series too. All three series were fun to watch, were competitive, and we got what we always wanted. A Canadian championship that players respect, that fans respect, that coaches respect, and that everybody else respected along the way, and it was fun to see. Now it's moving on to the, the portion of the tournament that we're used to, MLS teams and the Ottawa Fury. Well, two MLS teams anyway. But quickly on that, you know, not to be this guy, but had Halifax had their third goal correctly called as a goal oh, yeah. in the first tie. Well, it's we're having a penalties. different conversation today, aren't we? And <laughs> we're going to if penalties. You're, if you're, yeah, if we're a Fury fan... Uh, actually, we're we're not going to penalties. We're Ottawa's or Halifax goes through and away goals. But uh, if we're we're um, if you're an Ottawa fan that was like adamant that Campiel was not even worth your thought in terms of the lower level, there is no conceivable way that you can make that argument today. None. You watch Calgary as a champion beat an MLS team, and your own team struggle against a team that is at the bottom of the table in the Campiel right now. So if you're a Fury fan, you still want to make that argument? Come at me. Yes, one game, I get it, but there's how how did you prove that over the two games where you had a direct competition? Anyway, moving past from that, uh, yeah. Look, uh, I'm excited to get to get this in. Well, I have seen it in my own backyard this year, but I'm excited to get it at Beaver Field again and in the Canadian Championship. I, I got it. I'm not going to lie; it, uh, my love of it it always never waned. I love the Voyagers Cup. I love the history of it, but the competition was getting a little dull the last few years. It really was. It was kind of like a wake me up one more in the last 30 minutes of the final game, particularly the last three years where TFC's managed to win the damn thing in the final kick of the tournament three yeah. years in a row. So it has been exciting that way, but this is going to be a fun run in from here. And uh, oh, maybe Calgary, you know, can, can they run it all the way? The magic of the cup? E- ah, I don't know. They can try. It's tough to overcome too. Yeah. I mean, you know, if they, it'd be quite the story if the well, they $1 have to million be, dollar a year. They have to beat all three MLS teams as well to raise the Canadian championship. That's that's yeah, well, the that's a path to glory for cavalry. You beat one, you beat Vancouver. Okay, now Montreal. Now living in Montreal, then you get to uh, unless you're lucky, and Ottawa beats Toronto, which which could happen. But uh, <laughs> if if cavalry pull it off, 
eliminates all three MLS teams and wins the Canadian Championship in their first year. Yeah, talk about Cinderella story. Uh, what what's a better story than Cinderella? <laughs> like, well, what's a better fairy tale than story Cinderella? Because because that I would was, be a better story than Cinderella. I, I was going a little more cynical. I was going to go money wise. It'd be twenty six times their roster size or their budget size in terms of what they would be playing if they were to play TFC in a final. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves. I mean, here's a fun that they're going to be. Speaking of getting away with ourselves, and let, let's finish the show on a silly thought, a silly note. Any. Major League Soccer front office looking at that game last night. Be like, who's that Tommy coach? Should we get him for our team? Is that a possibility that with a win like this, there's repercussions for for a manager, like in a good way? Like, yeah, okay. Uh, I know maybe it wasn't in your plans and you want to give back to, to Calgary and we were all for that, but my name is Bob Bradley. I'm retiring in two years. You want an LAFC job? Yeah, well, I think that the other side of that is that there's a legitimate argument to be had that Tommy could stay at home and coach now, whereas in the past that he, he wouldn't have had that option. Yeah, is it an upgrade to go to MLS? Yeah, I think it still is, but particularly in pay, and that would be the difference and why a guy like that might be tempted there. But but he's there, and for him to stay there, now he has a chance to compete on it. He can, they can win the CONCACAF Nations League, uh, or Nations, sorry, not the Nations League, the CONCACAF League. League. There's too many, yeah. they all sound the same comp- same thing, the damn competitions anyway. They could win that and get to play an American MLS team on their own own accord anyway. And I think that that's, uh, that's something that's remarkable. The other part of that, obviously, we don't need to say is that surely if you're, at least the team's playing these, you're looking at some of these players and going, that guy's better than my left back. <laughs> Escalante? Like What's the guy's name? Escalante? Yeah, sign him up, please. He's good. He could be a good uh, fullback for anyone. Yeah, I, it, that's going to be very interesting the first time an MLS team tries to get a Canadian Premier League player because I have a hunch that the MLS are going to be reluctant to pay big transfers or even any transfers to Camp PL, that they'll be more likely to try and play the same route that they play with independent USL or NASL teams and that's to wait them out until they're at a contract. And I'm not sure Camp PL is going to be on board with that. That's going to be a very interesting story to watch moving forward, that, that you'll see some interest locally on these guys and the MLS will want them and will be making noises behind the scenes and making leaks to try and get there, but they will not be willing to pony up the money and that player will end up getting sold to Europe because that the, the Campiel wants to be part of the global market, as we said yesterday. Well, and if MLS isn't willing to pay a transfer, they're not going to have a lot of movement between those two leagues, I don't think. The Campiel is not here to just satisfy Major League Soccer. Be like, okay, this is going to make you happy if we transfer it to you? Okay, well, we'll take less money just to make you happy. No. <laughs> going to take the better offer. And if that offer comes from Europe, then so be it. But they're not there to, to help Major League Soccer. They're here to help the players they represent and their own teams. And that's a good idea. And uh, we'll see which one happens. And we'll see who will be the first player to be transferred out of the Canadian Premier League for a profit. Will it be Tristan Borges? Will it be Jordan Brown? Those are good, good candidates, and we'll see who of the two goes away first. But on that note, we'll wrap it up for today. We do want to thank Cavalry FC and Tommy Wilden Jr. for their time today. And as always, for Dwayne Rollins, I'm Kevin Laramie. We'll be back tomorrow, Monday to Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Mountain Time, 8 a.m. Pacific, for your world of soccer, world of football with a soccer perspective. And until then, as always, have a great soccer. You can find the podcast version of all the shows we do on iTunes, Apple Podcast, Google Play Store, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and anywhere you get your podcast.